adventure of my life to photograph the entire 6,211 kilometer Yangtze River in China. I set myself a challenge to photograph every 100 kilometers. 63 predetermined Y points from the river source at 5,400 meters above the sea level on the Tibetan plateau to the river mouth in Shanghai. I had no idea what I was going to photograph or whether I was even going to make it to the end. After eight trips, 1,200 sheets of films in the temperature range of minus 30 to plus 44 degrees, I finally stood with my feet in the sea. I want you to join me on this journey. Okay, so that's one minute. Um, I hope I explained the project uh, in a good way, concise way. So really, the Mother River is very easy to explain, but epic to actually do. Um, I photographed the entire 6,211 kilometer Yangtze River in China at precise interval of every 100 kilometers. But why on earth would anyone do that? It really. I felt it was one of the most uh, severe punishments for a photographer. <laughs> um, so for, I think a lot of people might not be very familiar with uh, the Yangtze River. So we'll start with some general knowledge. Um, then we'll go into some of the history of the Yangtze River's cultural position in China. Uh, I have to say at this point, I'm an I'm, um, artist, not an hi art historian. So what I say here might, might have a lot of gaps. I can see we have proper art historians in the audience. So, um, you know, if I did something wrong, you can contact me later. And, you know, obviously if you know more about the Yangtze River's uh, particularly pictorial representation, I'd be very happy to know about that. Okay, so the Yangtze River, <laughs> how can we say? The importance of the Yangtze River to China cannot be overstated. You know, these are just facts and figures. It runs through the entire China. You can see the little map on your right, the relatively, relative position of China in the world and the relative, relative position of the white line, the Yangtze River in China. And the bigger map on your left, the blue line roughly is the Yangtze River. So it traverses all the way from the west to the east of China. And what is the west of China? That particular area is the Tibetan Plateau. So over there at the moment, they might have about just one person per square kilometers. That's, that's the Tibetan Plateau. A lot of people are still having a quite nomadic lifestyle, you know, caring for their yaks. And then you go all the way to Shanghai you probably, I can't remember the exact number, like 5,000 people or more per square kilometers. So when it traverses the entire China, it also traverses some great, greatest geological and geographical diversities. But also we can see like the degrees of modernization where the river starts 5,400 meters uh, above the sea level. I'll give you a reference point. That's 600 meters higher than the summit of Mont Blanc. So there, no one lives there. No people. A lot of animals, but no people. It's not a, a, a place for humans to live. And obviously, you know, in Shanghai, it's as modern as anywhere. The river supports 40% China's uh, GDP. It grows more than 50% of its crops. Really, the future of the Yangtze River is like the future of China. You, if you want to know China, you can travel on the Yangtze River. You get to see it all. But in my project as an artist, I think my position, you know, yes, you can have all these hard facts and figures. But the question is, what is a river to me as an individual person? And I thought, the river was my mother river. 
And this is not just me thinking it's my mother river. It's kind of the same thing as to say the river represents my mother land, but how and why? So uh, we'll go back a little bit more. Instead of talking about what the river is to me, we expand it a little bit to what the river is to, to China. Uh, a very rough historical overview. Um, the first ever dynasty established in China, Xia Chao. Uh, you can see the figures, it's from about um, two, 2000 <laughs> years ago, BC. Um, according to the folklore, the first king of China enthroned, so the first king, the king of Xia dynasty, Da Yu, he was made the king because of his achievement in managing the great floods in China. So the, I think at the moment, there are a lot of uh, scholars um, doing a lot of research on you know, how historically accurate is this folklore. We'll not get into that. But there's something in China's history where the political right to rule seem to be connected to the physical ability to control water at the very beginning. And we will get back to this point slightly later. And, you know, um, Han Chinese people, so most of Chinese people, we have 57, uh, 56 ethnic minority groups and the ethnic majority is Han people, 90% of us. Our totem is this mythical dragon um, you can see on this dragon robe, that animal that's got a snake's body. Um, a dragon, its main power is in controlling water and rainfall and floods. And every Chinese king until the last dynasty of China claimed themselves as the son of the dragon. So again, you can see the connection around water, the dragon as a totem, um, the king's claim to its power. So that's through many different dynasties. They all said, I'm, you know, I'm the true king. I'm the son of the dragon. Okay. Um, but obviously the the connection to water is quite a broad one. You know, we have lots of great rivers in China, apart from the Yangtze River, we ha also have the Yellow River, also supposed to be a mother river. Um, but obviously today we are concentrating on the Yangtze River. So, you know, we believe that often um, a, country, a country's identity can be connected to the myths, legends, to the haloed sites, um, to the stories, that are remembered through, uh, you know, by generations of people. So, you know, if we narrow it down from water, let's look at the Yangtze River, for example, historical events. Um, <laughs> these are two pictures of uh, the door gods. So these are two historical figures. They were real human beings. One is called Zhang Fei. Uh, that's the one with a very bushy beard on your left. The other one with very flowy beard called uh, Guan Yu in, in, on your right. So these were actual historical figures in the Three Kingdoms period. And that is a really turbulent uh, uh, period in China. Um, their stories had been uh, immortalized, I suppose, at first written historical books and then written in this um, the romance of the three kingdoms. Um, those, that novel is a bit like Shakespeare's novels here. It's a story, well, they are the stories that every Chinese knows a little bit about. We have a lot of sayings, um, references, and they're always hidden there. So uh, and now these two real historical figures, um, the, you can see they were both warriors. And their battlefield was, of course, on the Yangtze River, mainly around the Three Gorges area and downstream. Um, now they are seen as not just historical, they are gods. 
So therefore, you know, they are really in us here somewhere. Uh, on Chinese New Year's Day, we put the portraits on our doors. That, that still goes on now. And, you know, jumping ahead a bit, this is a photograph I took during my Mother River project at a temple dedicated, see the bushy hair, a bushy beard of the figure on the wall, dedicate to him. And actually on the wall, it's a story about him having this famous battle at this very site in the Three Gorges near Chongqing. So I keep talking about the Three Gorges and Chongqing. I think now it's, it's time to just give you a little bit idea of where everything is because we'll I'll, you know, keep mentioning this. So I, I put these two examples in just to say, you know, there are so many stories and legends and heloed sites that are on this Yangtze River. And so its iconic status, the cultural icon, um, probably has always been there, not a recent thing. Okay, so um, I don't think I can do the traditional laser pointing. <laughs> um, can you see the Three Gorges Dam? The pink, yeah, okay. And on the two sides, one you have a major city called Chongqing and the smaller city called Yichang. So Chongqing is about the middle point of the Yangtze River. Between Chongqing and Yichang, that is a Three Gorges area. So after Yichang, you get into very flat land full of lakes. And that traditionally, that's a rich area. There were a lot of uh, trading going on. The soil is very fertile. And, you know, people were painting and making poems. Um, okay, so we jump ahead a little bit more. Um, the Yangtze River obviously was always in historical record and literature, but what about pictures? Um, obviously in China, we have uh, traditional uh, landscape paintings called Shan Shui. Shan means mountain, Shui means water. Uh, because in a way, all these paintings um, have similar content, mountain, mountain, mountains and water in various forms. Um, the traditional landscape paintings really started around the fourth century in East Jin Dynasty when China's capital was Nanjing. So it's a city 400, meter, 400 kilometers inland from Shanghai on the Yangtze River. But we didn't, I, well, obviously those early paintings didn't really survive. By Tang Dynasty, so in the eighth century, Shanghai paintings really uh, began to get established as a proper genre of art in China. And this painting by uh, Wang Wei, bear in mind, this is only a very small section of that painting. The whole thing is 400, well, nearly four and a half meters long. And it, it kind of became, <laughs> let's say, the, the, the foundation of thousands and thousands of Shanghai um, paintings that were to be painted in the next one half thousand years. Um, this painting was regarded as a masterpiece. It had very gradual, you know, uh, ink tonal ranges. Uh, it's an iconic view, even if it's an imagined uh, the Yangtze River with um, snow. But of course, in China, uh, we have landscape paintings. Our traditional poetry was also very much connected to uh, nature, natural scenery, and the Yangtze River. So contemporary to Wang Wei, we have uh, Li Bai, one of the greatest um, Chinese poets. And this particular uh, poem, he wrote many, yeah, <laughs> uh, on the Yangtze River, this particular one I read it, uh, from the walls of Bai Di. Bai Di is, again, it's a small town as entrance of the Three Gorges, 
where one of the kings from the three kingdoms died there. So, you know, there's a lot of historical reference from the walls of Fai Di high in the colored dawn to Jiangling by nightfall is 300 miles. We need to remember this line because we'll see this again. Yet monkeys are still calling on both banks behind me to my boat, these 10,000 mountains away. So, you know, he's really talking about a very fast flowing river full of uh, nature, monkeys, and very beautiful. Uh, you know, colored dawn with uh, clouds. Um, poems like this have been learned, I think perhaps in traditional China only by the educated literati, but in modern China, everybody who goes to school will learn this. Uh, we learned it in the school. Fast forward a, nearly a thousand years and the paintings stayed more or less the same. <laughs> and. Uh, this particular one you can see it's painted in the 17th century by Wang Shimin. Again, it's dedicated to the Yangtze River. And there are two lines of poem written by another great poet called Du Fu, again back in Tang Dynasty. And those two lines say, um, the endless autumn leaves keep falling down and the eternal Yangtze River keeps rolling by. So at this point, what we can say is these are extreme, simple, straightforward examples. But in traditional China, the Yangtze River, if we judge by the poems and by the paintings, really was more or less associated with this eternity of time. It's flowing, it doesn't change in a way because it keeps on flowing, it keeps on rolling by. Obviously it's also consistent to the traditional concept of time. It, it, it's, a, it's a circular shape, not a you know, arrowed shape. But all this uh, was to change when China began um, its, well, its struggle into the modern era. So obviously now we are getting into photography. Um, according to my, I would say limited research, the very first photograph ever produced in China uh, was of the Yangtze River in 1842 by a British army officer on one of their um, you know, army uh, ships, warships called HMS Queen. And this, there is a historical record. Major Malcolm and Dr. Usnan took a sketch of the play, place today on their daguerreotype. I cannot understand it at all, but on exposing a highly polished steel plate to the sun by the aid of some glue, it takes the scene before you on the plate. That is obviously a photographic event. <laughs> this was in 1842. Um, follow this on. So what, what, what was this time? 1842 was the first open war. So Britain and China was having a war over trading rights mainly. Um, so that's when the British warships sailed into China from the mouth of the Yangtze River. And following the warships, a lot of uh, Western photographers entered China. And one person, uh, he's actually Scottish, I think John Thompson, uh, he traveled on the Yangtze River several times during the, I, I believe in the 1860s and 1870s. And he published quite a few books on China and on the Yangtze River. These were part of the first batch of photographic record documentation from China introduced to back to its Western audiences. And this is John Thompson's view again of the three gorges. The, you know, there's something about this uh, gradual tonal change of the mountains. You know what, I really miss this kind of view. The mountains in Britain don't work in this way. <laughs> First, they don't have this kind of layer, uh, layers and also the concentration of uh, 
water or moist in the air doesn't quite work the same. So in a way, this kind of is an iconic view. I would like to think that these kind of pictures on the Yangtze River, particularly in this region, are still being produced in the millions and billions today. But what was John Thompson's position um, or perception of the river? There is uh, this quote. Um, let me see if I can move this a little bit so we can see this stuff. Maybe. Oh, okay, it's okay. So this is an, a paragraph uh, accompanying this particular picture, again taken within the Three Gorges. He says, I see no reason why the kind of steamer Captain Blackenstone has suggested should not navigate this, and indeed any of the other rapids on the river. Was the river once opened to trade, Daring and scientific skill would be forthcoming to accomplish the end in view. You could say this is a very Western and colonial uh, perception around the river now. So the river, you know, it's a target of scientific exploration. Um, it's a navigation challenge. It's a way to open up China for, at this point, you know, for Britain's colonial interest. Okay. And obviously, John Thompson wasn't alone. I was delighted to find uh, a, a woman, <laughs> uh, Lady Isabella Lucy Bird. She was a very keen traveler. And she uh, went to the Yangtze River. Again, they all trailed against the stream from Shanghai, uh, um, you know, onwards, well, backwards, in my view. And um, she published a series of books, but what I was quite interested in was this book, <laughs> this page. So, you know, I remembered the war warrior Zhang Fei and the temple uh, that's dedicated to him that I photographed. I realized uh, Isabella Bird also visited the same temple. <laughs> and, you know, she took a picture that was in her book. And you have more. Uh, for example, Joseph Rock is a uh, Austrian American explorer, photographer, and uh, botanist. And he was actually living in Lijiang. This is quite way upstream, about 2000 kilometers away from the source of the river. And um, he wrote many articles for the National Geographic magazine, took pictures, and obviously collected a lot of um, plant samples. So it's quite interesting. I, I have not found, I would probably not say any, but substantial cases of photography on the Yangtze River done by the Chinese people at this point. Everything I found was done by um, a non-Chinese photographer. Okay, you know, I said perhaps John Thompson had uh, quite a Western uh, colonial view towards the river, but actually, the Chinese people at this point uh, were in a similar position because we already entered the modern era. Um, let's do this as a timeline. So in 1911, the last feudal um, Chinese government, the Qing Dynasty was uh, outthrown, the Republic of China was founded. Nine years later, the president of the Republic of China, Sun Zhongshan, published actually in English originally, his book called The International, International Development of China. And in that, in this chapter called The Methods and Strategies of Establishing the Country, he already envisioned a dam on the Yangtze River. So you can see, as soon as we entered the modern era, the Yangtze River was almost like the first, the, the most important iconic natural um, feature to develop. And, uh, you know, a year later after his publication, the Nationalist Party government at the time already established Yangtze Jiang. Yangtze Jiang was, you know, one of the Yangtze River's Chinese name, a committee. And uh, in 1944, an uh, American hydroelectric engineer, John Lucy Savage, he was commissioned to do a survey 
for building a dam on the Yangtze River. And the site he proposed basically is the site where the dam is now. And I also talked to some geologists. They, they agree the, the site of the Three Gorges Dam is the most ideal site for this dam. So that was before the 19, uh, before 1949. So 1949 obviously is a historical milestone because that's when the Communist Party took over China and founded the People's Republic of China. Um, our dear Chairman Mao swam in the Yangtze River 17 times in the 1950s and 60s. So why did he do that? Obviously, there are many reasons, but uh, we guess uh, one of the reasons, well, he loved swimming. <laughs> one of the reasons was, you know, this is not any river. This is the greatest natural feature, the greatest power, natural power in China is the Yangtze River. If he can swim in that, you know, we are connecting this to the earlier connection between the river and the political power. You know, so his swimming is a lot more than exercise. It's a political statement. And with his swimming, he wrote poems. <laughs> and this one um, is very famous. Um, we won't read the whole thing, but you know, he talked about to hold back Wushan. Wushan is one of the mountains in the Three Gorges. Uh, Wushan's clouds and rain till a smooth lake rises in the narrow gorges. He is dreaming of a dam on the Yangtze River. And again, that is the vision. As soon as the new channel was pub, uh, founded, we immediately got on the task again, trying to develop China. And to develop China, we must develop the Yangtze River. And uh, now we are beginning, we're just beginning to see a lot of photographic images of the Yangtze River. And this particular picture done by Xue Zijiang in 1957 was seen as one of the 10 most iconic pictures in New China. And let's have a look. This picture would, be, would have been the view seen by the Tang poet Li Bai standing on the tiny city Bai Di. I have also been there myself, looking east. That's where the river is going into the sun and you know so china is going forward into the sun with the back uh, lit of the river and the title of the this picture jiangling at 600 miles away took only one day to reach is one line from li bai's poem so there's a historical reference but a historic historical continuation into how this view ought to be understood. And also, really interestingly, this picture does not have a traditional boat. It has modern boats or ships. And again, you know, it fits into this message where we are modern China now. We're going to the east, to the light, and we are going with machines, <laughs> not just wind power and sails. And so let's just go, okay, Xue Zijiang was obviously um, a journalist working for state-owned media and all of them were working for state-owned media. So his pictures would have been published in newspapers, magazines, and he also was very keen in writing and teaching photography. So he's bit like Ansel Adams in China at the time. But you'll be surprised to know that actually China didn't discover the source of the Yangtze River until 1976. And this was a picture taken on the day when they got there in 1976. And let's think about the significance of this discovery. So they found the source of the river, therefore they could tell you the length of the river. And the length of the river at the time, I think they said it was about 6,300 kilometers. It's the third longest river in China. That's another reason to be very proud of the river and the country we, 
we had one of the longest rivers in the world. And look at the view. It's grand, it's pure. This is the home of the home. It's a start of our mother river, kind of our motherland really as well. So very quickly, a year later, China's foreign um, magazine, I think it's called People's Pictorial, published a series of articles on the Yangtze River announcing the discovery and a lot of scientific facts. And finally, 1976 was the year I was born. And in 1983, when I was seven years old, I got to know about the river. And let's listen to a song first. See, come on. Mm -hmm. Where's the song? Can I go back, go back, show navigator. One, me, one moment here, yeah? let me just stop share and if I can find the song, I will do. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and so I'll explain why this song. In 1983, when I was seven years old, when very few Chinese family had the privilege to own a TV, um, the CCTV, China Central Television, made this 25 episode documentary called, well, simply The Yangtze River. And that song just now was a theme song. And uh, originally, when they aired the documentary series, they only had the tune, they didn't have the lyrics. And then they had a national campaign and trying to find the most suitable lyric. And this was the one that's chosen. And I've translated that for you into uh, English. And I will just read a little bit out for you. You come from the snow mountains, the spring tides are your colors. You run towards the East Sea, the mighty waves are your sizes. With your sweet milk, you'll bring up sons and daughters from all ethnic groups. With your strong shoulders, you'll support the mountains and oceans. We praise the long river. You are the ever flowing spring. We are attached to the long river. You have the heart of a mother. Okay, so we understand the mountains, no mountain, the east sea. Um, Let's think about these all ethnic groups. So basically here it's saying, you know, this river represents the naturally united China with uh, all of its ethnic groups. But obviously China didn't start off like that. Really the modern China's shape is a um, long process of historical struggles. If we started by just a little village somewhere in the Northwest of China, with uh, Northeast of China really. And we gradually expanded all directions. So China's current political unity actually has nothing to do with the Yangtze River. But because we managed to find the source of the Yangtze River right in the middle of the Tibetan plateau, that provided a, a, a fact to argue that we are naturally together. And the next line is even more interesting. You come from antiquity and you go towards the future you push our time forward. And we already said that before modern China, um, the river really was seen as a symbol of the eternity of time. 
But now the river becomes a metaphor for a time that's going forward. And really, this, this song is saying, you know, we as China is going forward together with the river. So it's making a little myth here saying that, you know, um, China's moving forward, China's modernization is as natural as a river. So my understanding is, you know, this song really is a political statement, but perhaps obviously um, said very subtly using natural facts. And I was seven years old by watching that series. That was my first time as a child to have a ge geographical imagination of my country. And this is how I saw my country. And this was my way into my project. I thought my motherland and my mother river looked just like the, how this song is portraying. Okay, so um, the documentary was aired in 1983 and the full set of Chinese currency was issued in 1988. And one of the notes feature a picture of the three gorges. So if you don't have a tally, you don't listen to radio, uh, you can't read, you've got to spend money. So by this time, a very realistic picture of the three gorges on the Yangtze River is now in everybody's hand in China. It doesn't matter if you're in Tibet, if you're in, in the Mongolia, you're in Beijing, you think the river ought to look like this. Fast forward a little bit. And in 1992, we decided to build a dam. Well, we already had a test one called Gezhouba on the Yangtze River, but the Three Gorges Dam is a technological challenge. Um, between 1994 and 2010, it took so many years to build the Three Gorges Dam. Now we have over 30 on the river. Interestingly, the new set of Chinese currency issued in 1999. So that's five years after the Three Gorges project began, we still had a beautiful picture of the Three Gorges. That is um, Kuimen, so it's an entrance, up, upstream entrance of the Three Gorges printed on the money. We're not mentioning the dam. And finally, now, like today you can try this, you can put the Yangtze River's Chinese name in Chinese search Google Baidu. These are type of pictures you get. Natural scenery, the three gorges and the bridges symbolizing the modern China. If you put Yangtze River in Google, <laughs> you get a set of similar pictures. So, you know, these kind of pictures represent how the river is in, in the general visual culture um, as still quite a natural, you know, icon. Um, for the Chinese, we all know it's a mother river, but for normal tourists, if you go, on, uh, if you go to take a Yangtze cruise um, ship, you'd expect to see something like this. At the same time, when the Three Gorges Dam project began, the, con or the cost or the historical and cultural cost of modernizing China has been laid bare for everyone to see, including the Chinese, we all struggled in China. What? That means the Yangtze River. And uh, you know, in the West, we have uh, photographers such as Batinsky. He photographed this demolished village in the Three Gorges. It was demolished to give way to the dam. We have uh, Nand of Kanda traveling on the Yangtze River and I think the pictures are quite personal, but overall the, the smogish tone also sent out quite a negative message. Um, we have Chinese critical photographers. You know, this is Yang Yongliang's work. Um, a, co a collage made of thousands of pictures. The, the base pictures were of demolished cities and towns and high rises in the, um, uh, in the new cities based on a traditional and iconic um, Shanshui painting. 
Again, Yang Yongliang says, I criticize modern China from a traditional literary point of view. Well, that's interesting, but actually, according to my own, again, limited research, a lot of historians, environmental historians have done research. Traditional China's environment was far from pristine. So really the view painted in Shanshui paintings was not equal to China's environmental reality at the time. So I think there's some kind of romanticizing act going on, like traditional China was all good and we're not now. And this is not, not a collage, but a street picture. This is a Three Gorgeous Dam again by another photographer, Zheng Han. He named his theory Ku Shan Shui. So again, to say that, you know, modern China is really killing our history. So now we have a split image of the Yangtze River now. One is still that beautiful and natural, natural icon loved by the Chinese as a mother river and perhaps by non-Chinese people for its uh, natural scenery. But at the same time, the river is seen as the environmental victim of China. And this was the context of my own project. And you have celebratory pictures and you know, environmental degradation pictures. And let's see where the pictures were from. So some of the photographers I didn't mention here, but uh, you can see most of them were concentrated in the major cities in the mid and downstream areas. Everybody goes to the Three Gorges. And there's a lot of um, area in China, nobody ever goes. So I realized there is a his regional hierarchy going on here when photographing the Yangtze River. Don't worry, P, I'm about to finish. <laughs> and uh, and um, so there's a re regional hierarchy when the Yangtze River, the Three Gorges have always been the hotspot. It doesn't matter if you want to celebrate the river or you want to condemn the river. Everybody goes there. And that, then it's the few major cities. Then nobody goes anywhere else. Well, it's a little bit like overgeneralization, but you get the idea. And also we already said the pictures came from two sets, celebratory pictures or environmental degradation pictures. And so basically this explains my project very well. I decided to do the project in a way that is every 100 kilometers. The emphasis is not on 100, but it's on every. So I'm conceptually trying to challenge that deep seated regional hierarchy in how the river has been represented visually. But obviously the pictures themselves are going to be very important because you know, I, I wanted to, to talk about the complexity rather than it's good or it's bad. And so that, that was basically the intention to photograph this river every 100 kilometers. So I think the time is up and I have managed to explain why I did it in this way. And, you know, again, as I said, all of the pictures are on my website. We'll just, I'll put one up here, I'll finish up. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Right. Stop sharing. Okay, working. <laughs> That's a mad one. Okay, this is a good one. You know, not good or bad, just how it is. So all of the pictures are on my website, plus lots of little videos. Everything I'll be talking about here will be apart from the part that's already talked in my website, on my website and in my book. So uh, feel free to have a look and thank you. Now we open to questions. <laughs>